So the crazy thing about being an Olympian and also winning Love Island, the chances of doing either are like 0.01%. I wanted to play for Munster and Tomlin Park more than I wanted to play for Ireland. It says a lot. The chain came loose and I fell off the bike and I looked down, there was blood everywhere. I don't have a leg right now. Hi, oh yeah, I'm Greg O'Shea and this is my Jersey Tales. O'Shea, more space for O'Shea, oh, he's got away! Second time, Greg O'Shea. Star of the Love Island TV reality show. Well, I tell you what, he was getting real there. All right, so where do I start my rugby journey? It's a complicated one. Um, club, school, representative rugby all the way up to the Olympics. So I suppose I just get started where I was as a teeny bopper. So I started playing with Shanning, first of all, when I was five years old, and I absolutely hated it. I hated rugby. Then eventually, around seven, I think, I, uh, I kind of manned up a bit and got back out there and fell in love with the game. And I haven't looked back since. It was never a, an option whether I was playing with Shannon or not. All my family are involved with the local club. Um, my mom did the tuck shop for a while. My dad uh, managed for a while. My uncle was uh, president last year, so really a uh, big family team. My cousin plays with him currently. And um, yeah, I love Shannon, really close to my heart. Playing for Munster is, means more to people in Munster than playing for Ireland. I wanted to play for Munster in Tomlin Park more than I wanted to play for Ireland. It says a lot. And this is my first proper rep representative rugby, my own Munster jersey. And it just meant so much to, to be able to represent my family, my friends, and where I come from, and wear the Red of Munster in Tomlin Park. Irish under 20s jersey here and luckily I actually started the first Six Nations game on the wing where I scored a, a try as well so I got my first start in Six Nations and I scored a try. Gary Ringrose made a break and I came in underneath him and got in and scored. I was picking up niggly injuries and um, for my hamstrings so I didn't make the World Cup squad that year and um, broke my heart so I decided to follow my girlfriend at the time over to uh, she was in America. I went to visit her and I regret it to the day I die because I was cycling home on a bike one day and the chain came loose and I fell off the bike. And if you know the cog of the bike, uh, I basically kicked that with the, my Achilles and it was like getting a knife and just cutting my Achilles tendon in two, like lacerated it, gone completely. And I looked down, there was blood everywhere. And I was like, I, how am I gonna tell Munster what's happened? Like, this is outrageous, I don't have a leg right now. Come back into Munster following all this surgery and I'm lying on the physio bed. Anthony Foley was the head coach at this time. He walks into the physio room and uh, comes over to me and he uh, just digs me in the arm and goes, you are a F word Muppet. I could see that he was coded for me because um, I'd been so, ups so upset like not being in the World Cup squad and being so injury prone and now I just picked up this massive accident injury and uh, but that was kind of his way of showing love, just digging me in the arm and calling me an effing Muppet. So uh, I uh, look back on his time in Munster really fondly and so does everyone else in Munster and God rest his soul, he did a lot for the, for the Red of Munster. So this jersey here is my first Sevens jersey. This is the jersey I wore for my first cap in the sevens team and the reason I moved into the sevens team was because of that injury I spoke about earlier and I was trying to come back and fight for a place in the senior squad but obviously I just wasn't in the shape and I wasn't the athlete I needed to be to take up a senior contract. Razi Erasmus was the director of rugby at that time and I asked him for a meeting and he, he called me in and he goes, long story short, we just don't have a, a contract for you. You haven't been fit all year and we, we don't have any spare uh, factory contracts and it broke my heart. I remember looking him in the eye and I was like, Raz, I didn't say this, but it, the look on my face was just, I can't believe you're tearing down my dreams of wanting to play for Munster. And he said, look, rugby career is not over for you though. You can keep trying, you never know what will happen down the line. And at that stage, the seven team had come in looking for me because I was known as the fast guy, I was a back three player. Luckily the seven team picked me up and then this was my first jersey, and my first cap against Portugal um, in the rugby Europe. I came off the bench and scored two tries, and so this means a lot to me, my first cap, scoring as well. So this next jersey is probably my favorite one ever. Um, the Olympic one might come close to it now. It just means so much because it took like four or five years of coming all the way through the divisions. And the thing about sevens rugby is we're not paid anywhere near as much as the 15s. We all have second jobs, we all study uh, to try and make money on the side. So to do it, in that hardship kind of way with your mates and, and, and grind it out 
I remember in the final whistle we beat Hong Kong in Hong Kong and it was just complete relief that we'd done it and we got there and then obviously we celebrated then afterwards and it was just complete elation. <laughs> a lot to me and it hangs in my room and I see it every single day. So the Tokyo Olympics was a unique one in that it's the Tokyo that happened during Covid but it's still an Olympics at the end of the day and it was still the competitive Olympics that you'd expect to have. It was just restricted in that we couldn't go to other events or we weren't allowed to see Tokyo City um, but it just had to be that way like imagine Covid broke out in the Olympic Village the top 1% of athletes in the world getting Covid that's just not an option like so and it had to be that way and I absolutely loved it. So the season leading up to qualifying for the Olympics was the same season that Love Island were on to me asking me to go into the show. So I even have my Love Island <laughs> memorabilia here. So this is my bottle from the show and you can see it's a bit used and so it's just kind of a nice uh, memory to have. And I also have the bottle from the baby challenge. Uh, myself and Amber call our, our baby doll Kobe. So I have the two bottles there, which is kind of a nice memory from the show. I watched the show like everyone else for the first six weeks. And uh, just before we were about to fly out to go to the Olympic qualifier in Colombia, I got a call off Love Island and they said, look, we, we want you to go in, how can we make this work? And I said, I'm gonna be at this Olympic tournament in France. Um, I'm finished on Sunday evening. If you wanna fly me in from there, you can, but I can't do anything other than that. So I finished playing on the Sunday and I told the lads I had to get home for a family issue. And I left the hotel and I went straight to the airport and flew to Majorca. And the next day I went into the villa. So it was mad. I still had like all the cuts and scrapes and the lads were still only traveling home. And um, so it was madness for them and they didn't realize that I was actually going into the show. So that all happened. I ended up winning Love Island, which is nuts, but we still hadn't qualified for the Olympics. So all this is happening to me. I'm the winner of Love Island. Everyone expects me to go to the UK and be a big celebrity and follow the celebrity lifestyle. But little did I know that I still had the goal of getting to the Olympics. So I came back to Ireland and I stuck, stuck it with it with the sevens team. Like said no to all the money, said no to the golden ticket. Came home to the boys and I was like, look, this is the Olympic dream. I want to get there and I'm, nothing's going to get in the way of that. And uh, just qualifying for the Olympics was unbelievable. I remember I started nearly laughing on the pitch because I couldn't believe we'd done it after years of every day waking up and being, we have to play the Olympic qualifying, we have to win it, we have to get to the Olympics. Because so I'm after throwing everything away from Love Island to get to the Olympics. So I have to do it, it wasn't an option. So the crazy thing about being an Olympian and also winning Love Island is I think both of them are, the chances of doing either are like 0.01%. And I just feel so lucky and so grateful, but they're two very different feelings. Winning Love Island was amazing and a ridiculous experience and so unique. And I loved it, but the thing was, I felt like I didn't do any work for it. Do you know what I mean? I went in for two weeks and at the end of the day, you're in a villa in the sun, in your shorts, like having fun, doing challenges, meeting people. It's great crack, I absolutely love the show, but it, you don't work for it. The Olympics was years and years and years. Like I remember that, like it being a little fella, getting my mother to drive me to school before school. She'd be getting up at six to drive me to the pitches and I'd be out there by myself, running around the pitches in the freezing cold before school. And just those years um, coming all the way through, all my injuries, all my failures, um, and just getting to the pinnacle of sport. It's just like, hard work pays off and it's just a sense of achievement and happiness. Um, Love Island is great, but it's just, it won't go anywhere near the feeling I got when I got to the Olympics. Thanks very much for watching my Jersey Tales. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And please subscribe to World Rugby's YouTube. They are so close to 1 million, so you can be that 1 million subscriber.